Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Analyzing Anfield, your tax and analytics podcast, courtesy of the Blood Red channel. I'm Josh Williams and I'm joined by David Hughes. Dave, how's things, mate? Yeah, good. Thank you, mate. Very good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, busy Christmas period upon us. Um, games are all over the place, really, so we're just trying to fit, fit these podcasts in when we can. Um, so t- today we have quite a busy episode. We have to talk briefly about Aston Villa. We're going to talk about briefly again Champions League draw, uh, and we're going to look ahead to Newcastle United on Thursday night and Spurs over the weekend. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll, we'll start with um, with Villa because it it does feel like it was a while away to be honest, even though it kind of wasn't. But one thing I wanted to ask you Dave, mainly about the match was. I think since the game, obviously, naturally, because Stephen Gerrard was in charge of the visiting team, Gerrard's received, I wouldn't say criticism, but some people have questioned whether that approach that he took would work at Liverpool type thing and, you know, whether it's translatable and things like that. So would you say Gerrard was wrong to, to set up in the way that he did with, you know, obviously Stephen possession a little bit? Uh, I think there was quite a bit of time wasting going on. Uh, I don't know if that was specific to Gerard or whether that was because the likes of Emmy Martinez is on the pitch, actually Young on the pitch. These players know what they're doing. But what what what's your general stance on on that sort of thing and how how an opposing coach can come to Anfield and play and and come away with in a positive light? I think it's quite difficult. Yeah, it is. Look, I think um, <clears throat> I think what you've got, got got to obviously think about is. Um, He's, he's obviously striving to be a winning coach as opposed to, you know, being really strict on, um, you know, perhaps a philosophy. Now, we, we talked those in the show last week that um, he has ide- ideologies he wants to implement um, and he's talked about them already about what he wants uh, Villa to be. You know, I think we talked about them. We said, you know, possession-based side, uh, having certain principles. Um, but you've also got to be got to be wise with it. Um, and if you think of... A few weeks ago, Arteta's Arsenal coming to Anfield, trying to implement that kind of um, passing out from the back, short, um, building through the phases type of type of football, and got massively punished. You know, it was a uh, bread and butter for Liverpool, really. You know, forcing turnovers uh, close to the Arsenal goal, obviously scoring a couple of goals from it, um, and it was almost you know a, a little bit suicidal. And I think. It would have been the same situation for Aston Villa had they tried to implement something similar. So I think uh, to answer your question, uh, he's probably looked at it and thought he's going to have to veer away a little bit from his uh, from the, the, the way he wants Aston Villa to play, the type of team they want to be, um, with the view of trying to get a result. And okay, they rode the look a little bit. Uh, underlying numbers paint Liverpool deserving winners, uh, but it was still only one 0 on the day and had. Villa being able to create something maybe from a set piece and nick a goal, then they could have come away with a, a valuable point. So I guess to answer your question, Josh, the priority was to get a positive result and, and he, he obviously thought setting up in that way would deliver it. Yeah, I mean, I do I do think from a Liverpool perspective, it's, it's not one we should analyse too much in terms of Gerrard. You know, even, even around the game, everything what Gerrard was saying, everything he was doing, was getting micro-analysed. Uh, and it doesn't really have to, I think, especially considering... He's only been in charge for a, about a month, maybe. Mm-hmm. So, you know, to, to be in charge for a month and then to come to one field and play in an attacking manner, you know, expansive football or whatever, I think it's difficult. Um, and I don't think they were, they were totally, you know, def- defensive per se, if you want to use that word. I think uh, they, they tried to pose a bit of a threat, but I just think Liverpool nullified them a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at the numbers behind the game, 63% possession for Liverpool alongside 20 shots and an expected goals of 2.5. Uh, I will say some of that 2.5 is a penalty. So it's not as high as that in reality, but um, still enough to, to secure a win. Whereas Villa, uh, 37% possession, five shots, none of them on target, and that expected goals of just 0.3. I do think we said before the game last week when we were previewing it, I don't think, I, I, I couldn't see Villa scoring. I, I just didn't think they would find an net against Liverpool. And my, my thing was, can Liverpool break them down? And although Liverpool generated a fair few opportunities to score there, um, 
they, 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 they still needed a penalty to get to get through ultimately. So I do think we, I mean, I don't want to blow our own trumpet here, Dave, but I do think we painted Villa as, as, as the right type of opponent in terms of being difficult to break down. And I do think moving forward, I think they'll be a tough team to beat. I really mm-hmm. do. I'll be, I'm interested to see where they finish because there's plenty of the season left. And as it stands right now, pretty sure they are. Yeah, they're only six points off fourth, mate. <laughs> so yeah. you never know. I, I wouldn't expect. And I mean, I know you said that tongue in cheek. I wouldn't expect them to be Champions League, but no. You look since Villa's. Sorry, since Gerard's come in, they've they've only lost two games, won the other four, and that was against City and Liverpool. You know, the two best sides in the division, and. Certainly, scoreline wise, they were tight games. You know, they were they were tight at two um, one against City and obviously one 0 against Liverpool. So, I mean, it it has been a really good impact he's had at the club. Uh, and considering there's been a few new managers going in up and down the country, you'd, you'd probably say he's he's had the best impact o- over the you know the past two months or so. Yeah, I mean, just generally looking, I feel it was a team on the day. I I was. I was still quite impressed. I thought he looked, he looked like a, a very well drilled team. He said when he got the job that he was going to focus on the defence primarily at the start because that was where they were leaking goals, that was where the issues were coming. I think it was clear based on the game that the defence is what he's worked on and not the attack. I think the attack is still finding, finding feet. But I think generally going away from the game, I, I've got no major concerns about Gerard being like a defensive coach and like that. I thought he put in a game plan. I thought they were very well organised. They applied themselves. Um and as I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna be interested to to follow his team and see how he does. But I think Liverpool, yeah, deserve winners. Um yeah. I don't think we'll dwell on it for too much longer because as I said, games are coming thick and fast. And shortly after the Villa game, I think it was after uh, the Champions League draw got conducted. Liverpool drew Salzburg and then <laughs> the Champions League draw got conducted again. <laughs> uh, unbelievable, would, to be honest. If you did it out of 10, how would you how would you uh, value those two draws? Salzburg first and then the Inter Milan? I think not even just Salzburg, but who everybody else got as well. I thought it was, a, it was a good draw all round. Bayern got Atletico, which I thought was great for us. Uh, United obviously got PSG, I think. Which I thought was was decent for us and things like that. Um, so when it got flipped and it went the other way, Liverpool obviously get into Milan, a better opponent, and Chelsea stick with Lille. Um, I think Bayern get Benfica or someone like that, Sporting or someone. Who, I think they got. Mm. So yeah, it was definitely a negative flip. I think initially when Liverpool in the first throw that that happened, I think Liverpool probably gave it about about an eight or a nine, really. But then when it comes to Inter Milan, I think it drops down to about a five. But mm. still within, as relatively speaking, I still expect Liverpool to, to dominate the tie. Yeah, uh, I'd probably agree. I did have a look at Inter Milan earlier. And I mean, to be fair, you know, the the top of, top of City are at the moment, um, a point over AC Milan. And, you know, both, both metrics that we kind of pay attention to just to get a, a basic overview of a team. You know, leading the way in terms of XG, um, there's just three sides with a better XG against, but you know, XG goal difference, they're, they're comfortably the best side, and um, you know, they do look a good outfit. It's just the problem is, you, you it, and no disrespect, of course, t- to that division, but you do consider that you look at the levels that uh, Manchester City, Liverpool are operating at, even Chelsea, although they've had a little bit of a wobble recently, but you look at the levels they're operating at. And compare that to say City A, um, and I think there's a there is a bit of a gulf in, in quality there at the moment. Uh, for example, I couldn't imagine um, Ed and Jekyll still being like a Premier League striker if that makes sense. But obviously, he's he's been quite an important player for Inter this year. Yeah, well, I was going to say though, those who haven't kept track of Inter for a while. Obviously, the the one Serie A last season uh, finally broke the events. As, stranglehold on the league really under Antonio Conte but in the summer they kind of went through a bit of upheaval obviously Lukaku was sold Hikimi was sold and on the back of those sales Conte wasn't happy so Conte left as well but they've appointed Simeone and Zaghi to replace Conte and 
he has sensibly, in my opinion, just kept everything the same. He's kept the exact system that Conte established, kept the system that won the league, with that being a 3-5-2. And they just replaced Lukaku with Jeho, and they replaced Hakimi with... I think they replaced him with Matteo Damian, uh, who used to be in United, obviously. Yeah, I think they did, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I think, so far this season, I think they're still benefiting from that strength that they showed last season. And I think that can generally happen. I always go back to Everton, Dave. And I remember when... Do we have to? <laughs> I remember when... Uh, this is a positive, actually. I remember when um, Roberto Martinez got the job. And I feel like his first season, he massively benefited from having the backbone of what Moyes had, had, inst- had instilled for the previous like five years or whatever, it, or whatever it was. So I feel like for a year, Everton got, got kind of like a mix of Martinez and Moyes football. And I think you could argue both of those strengths and weaknesses, they kind of they complement well each other, Martinez and Moyes, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, was a, it, was, it was almost a hybrid kind of football that made Everton really dangerous you know that that year that uh, the, it was the same year as Liverpool nearly won the league wasn't yeah. it the year 13 14 but you know Everton were really good that year and I think every, any other year in the Premier League they, uh, they would have qualified for the Champions League with the points tally but um obviously that season the top sides are really good and I think they fell short by about four or five points in the end but yeah you spot on I think it's actually a really good comparison um it'll just be interesting won't it to see in the uh in the coming seasons, if similar to what happened at Everton, when Zaghi starts maybe putting a little bit more of his uh, print on the on the side, if, if then that leads to a little bit of a decline. Yeah, well, I also think you can throw Newcastle in there. I think when, when Benitez left, Steve Bruce came in. And I think Steve Bruce just kept everything the same, maybe added a bit more attack and freedom on the, on the shoulders of, like, St. Maximum and players like that. And I think, you know, people seeing graphs everywhere, um, stats everywhere saying like Steve Bruce has got more points than Rafa over these games or whatever but I think again Bruce has I think benefited, benefited from what Rafa put in as a coach obviously Newcastle have fallen off a little bit now um, but I think if you look at Inter they do still look like the strongest team in Italy and that seems to stem from what Conte instilled last season um, scored the most goals in Serie A this season as well and conceded the second fewest and if you look at their season so far in all competitions, they've lost three times. Um, two of those against Real Madrid in the Champions League groups and the other one against Lazio. So I don't think it will be by any means an, an easy fixture. You know, these have, these have got they've got good players. You know, Toro Martinez, I think, is their top scorer this season. They have Nico Barella in the middle of the park. Um, Jeho is obviously a capable player and I suppose is somewhat similar in the skill set to Lukaku, so I think that's a reasonable replacement short term at least. Um, but yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how how both teams look when it gets closer to the tie. But I think it's it's probably up there with the toughest Liverpool Liverpool could have got to be honest, because we couldn't get Atletico, and I suppose the other toughest would be would have been PSG. But then if we got PSG, I think we'd be sat here now talking about how they've got three passengers up front. Mm, um, yeah. I don't think Inter have that. I think, yeah. One thing I would, I would flag uh, positive from a Liverpool point of view is that um, I'm just having a look at their Champions League uh, results this season. Um, and they played uh, Sharif, uh, Shakhtar the next, uh, and Real Madrid. And they were obviously they, they won the, the other two games, but the, the two fixtures home and away against uh, Real Madrid, they lost. And you kind of look at that, okay, it's a, it's going to be a different uh, environment because we're talking group stage compared to knockout phase. But if you can kind of compare that Real Madrid side to this Liverpool team, um, I think this Liverpool team is better. So if they, if Madrid have won home and away against them, that kind of, um, I think, gives a good feeling from a Liverpool point of view that they should be able to do similar. Yeah, I also think it kind of benefits Liverpool to, to come up against a team where you, you absolutely know how they're going to play, and you know what system they're going to use to, to virtually guarantee it to use three five two. I think Liverpool can get in a position where they kind of pin them back um, to the extent that you know the, the front two are kind of the only way out in a way. Um, and obviously Liverpool have just dominated AC Milan comfortably with a with a B team. 
I think Inter are stronger, but I don't. I, I think Liverpool's intensity, just the intensity of English football, but particularly Klopp. I just think, in comparison to Italy at the moment, I always think Italian football looks really, really slow compared to English football lately. Mm. Um, and if you look at the, you know, Inter Milan's pressing numbers and things like that, they're not like particularly a pressing team. PPDA is kind of, I think they're the ninth in the league for PPDA, passes per defensive action. And I think in terms of pressing, you know, just attacking third pressures, middle third pressures, defensive third pressures, again, nowhere near the top in any of them. So I think they're just, they're a good tactical side. And they've got, they've got decent individuals and things like that, but I would still put Liverpool as favourites. Um, I'm not particularly, uh, you know, concerned or anything like that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure you've got any, any, any more to add on this. No, I mean, that's literally how I feel about it. I think it's, uh, it could have definitely been better. I thought the Salzburg draw was really good for Liverpool, uh, kind of ideal. And that what again, not to disrespect Salzburg, um, you know, we talked about them many times, quite glowingly, uh, but I think it's, it's shown in the past when Liverpool have come up against Salzburg, Leipzig, you know, those kind of sides that they tend to have too much for them. So I thought that was a good draw. Inter makes it a little bit more difficult. But I, again, I'm not sure if it's just a reputation thing. You know, Inter obviously a, a big club on Europe, in Europe. So on paper, this looks like a battle between two massive clubs. But if you're kind of looking at the 11s of both, uh, the situation both are in, uh, you, you'd have to you'd have to say uh, Liverpool are favourites. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they progressed um, with wins home and away as well. But you know maybe yeah. the, the land will look a little bit different in February. Yeah, I don't think we want to go too too easy on it. You know, and say I'm just saying that Liverpool are going to find it easy and like that. But I, I wouldn't rule out two wins myself. I do I do think it's possible. Um, obviously Liverpool swept aside the whole of their group, and we had a relatively tricky group, I think. Uh, so yeah, we'll move on anyway. We'll move on to Thursday's game against Newcastle, which is quite close actually. We're recording on around Wednesday lunchtime at the minute. But the return of Eddie Howe, mate, Klopp's favourite opponent, really. Because he's a bit of a whipping boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he just yeah, well, he, he, he never seems to get a sniff, to be honest. And then on yeah. the back of not getting a sniff, he seems to come and buy Liverpool's deadwood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he's a welcome addition. And you can probably see that happen a lot again now at Newcastle, can't you? Uh, with that the that finish, available. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, he's a favourite opponent of Klopp's. And, you know, so far he's been a favourite opponent of, of everyone that Newcastle faced. I mean, he's come in and hasn't really changed that much positively. You know, the, the uh, Newcastle picked up one win, I think, under him. Uh, but... That's it, really. And there's been defeats to Arsenal, draws against Norwich. Uh, got hammered on the weekend against Leicester 4 0. Um, so he hasn't really. We were talking about the impact managers have had at, at clubs. You look at like Gerard, for example, at Villa, really positive. How hasn't really had that as of yet? Uh, and albeit he's coming into a much tougher environment, you know, Newcastle do look poor. Uh, but you would have liked to think that. Uh, with the takeover and with the new manager, they'd be a, a little bit more of a daunting prospect. I think we would have thought they would have been if we were previewing this a month ago. But you look at it now and you think, yeah, you know, Liverpool should have a fairly routine even. Yeah, I think out of all the games all season, this feels like the most likely to, to result in a win. I am extremely confident about this one. Um, not just because it's Eddie Howe. And I think, you know, Klopp's record against Howe over the years when he was at Bournemouth was just perfect, really. Apart from that, <laughs> the, the mad match with the Carriers in goal. And I think it finished 4-3 to, to Bournemouth, I think, actually, away from uh, home. But... Was that Nathan Ake scored? Yeah, Nathan yeah. Ake scored, yeah. A few other random scored as well, mad goals. and things. wild but, game, though. Yeah. Liverpool had 3 in the lead, I think, in that game. Yeah, I remember it being just absolute bizarre. Bizarre set of circumstances. And not seen since, ironically. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Newcastle's Newcastle results have not been great this season so far throughout the whole of the campaign. Um, they've won once in all competitions, and that was against Burnley, and it was a 1 0 win. Um, and since how took charge, I just said, I think, I think his first game was Brentford. So if it was Brentford, I'm looking at the numbers now. Uh, to be fair, he probably deserved the win against Brentford. He posted mm. double the expected goals that Brentford posted. But then he got hammered by Arsenal by the looks of it. 
flip of a coin against Norwich. Probably just edged it against Burnley, and then they got hammered again by Leicester. But I think two things I would note there, mate, is against Arsenal, they conceded an XG of 2. And against Leicester, they conceded an XG of 2.5. Arguably the only two decent sides they've faced so far. Now, when it comes to facing Liverpool, in my opinion, probably the best attack in Europe, if not that, definitely the second best. It's It, it could be a kicker to go. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You know, <clears throat> I, um, I had a really quick look at, um, you know, just like it, they, they expect the points this season, comfortably the worst side in the division based on them. Um, and yet you think if they, they had two real tests so far, Leicester, Arsenal, and both of them are not on the same level as Liverpool. Um, Liverpool obviously highly motivated because they needed to keep winning. Uh, City have already won, which puts the pressure on a little bit that they need. And do you think, by the way, uh, before I continue, that the fact City scored seven goals does kind of come in, play on Liverpool's mind a little bit because the deficit in terms of the goal difference has gone from 10 to, to 3. Uh, so they're probably looking at it thinking not only do we beat Newcastle, but we we, we should really hammer them because it, it could be a little bit of a a good opportunity to open that gap again. Um, and we know when City and Liverpool tend to go at it like they are this season, uh, the fans, the margins might decide it. Yeah, I, I do always wonder, you know, to be honest, whether whether, whether that t- sort of thing does play on the minds of, of managers. Um, I assume it does later in the season and things like that, but I always wonder if at this early stage, not even really halfway in yet, whether managers are thinking about giving the goals a boost and just, just scoring as many as possible, getting the best goal difference and things like that. I would be interested to speak to, you know, someone in the game, a coach, a manager or whatever. I mean, I mean, I mean I'm sure I'm sure they'll deny it, like, to be honest. They'll probably just yeah. say, Three points is the is the key, isn't it? But I know I know what you're saying, especially when it comes to having a bit of a triple threat for the title. It could come down to it, and so far Liverpool have the best goal difference, and you know that could that that could take a significant boost against Newcastle. I'm just looking at what they've been doing lately. So in Hal's first game, they stuck with a three four three, um, and I think that was probably because that's the system that Brentford pretty much play. So. Howes probably chose to match them there. But since, he's moved to a 4-4-2 in every game. And I'm just looking at their 4-4-2, Dave, right? Yeah. And it, it, on paper, at least, it looks so open. Like, l- listen to this as a midfield four, right? Midfield bank of four. Miguel Almoron on the flanks with St. Maxima. And a midfield two in the middle of Joe Willock and John Joe Shelby. Both of whom I would not put in. Pff, no, I'd put Joe Willis as an A for the start because I think he's yeah. very attack minded. And John Joe Shelby, we know. Every, everyone is well aware of, I suppose, the. In the defense. Yeah, I suppose. He's a bit, I think he's a bit of a passenger defensively, to be honest. I think you have to carry him a little bit. I mm. think if you're going to put Shelby in the midfield too, you have to put him alongside someone like I can say, to be honest. Mm. Um, so. Looking at that as a midfield four. And Willock isn't that, is he? Let's be honest. No, no, he's not. Don't don't get me wrong, Willock's a good player. But yeah, I don't like him, yeah. I wouldn't have him as good Shelby as his partner, I don't think. And then yeah, obviously, he, he's someone you value more on the ball than off it, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. And I think if you if you look behind those players, they've got a mid uh, a defensive four of Javi Manquilo, uh Fabian Shah. Jamal Lascelles and Jamal Lewis. Mm. So, and you've got Callum Wilson and Joe Linton up front. Apparently, Joe Linton's been doing all right, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's one thing. Uh, I haven't watched a ton of Newcastle, but what I have seen uh, and what I've read, uh, he, he seems to be doing a lot better. You know, he seems to be putting himself about a little bit. I think he's got one or two goals as well. So, maybe he's a little bit more of a, a problem than he would have been uh, a couple of months ago. And Wilson's always dangerous, isn't he? To be fair, Josh, he's you know he, he he tends to be a player who scores off very few chances. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, looking at that team, the, the, I suppose you do have individuals that generally can be a little bit tricky to cope with. I think Saint Maximan obviously is nuts <laughs> as a player; he's incredibly difficult to predict. Yeah, um, and then you've got Armour on who can cover ground quite quick, decent on the break, I suppose. And then you've got again. Callum Wilson, who's probably the major threat. I think last time we we faced Newcastle, 
he was probably the major threat. I think he scored, or if he didn't, if he didn't score, the goal that he found, that he did score was ruled out. Uh, I think late in the game, mm. uh, I think that might have been like a two all draw or something around field. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember the one. That was I think a painful had, one. Now. Yeah, yeah, it got ruled out, but then he scored again, didn't he? Something like thirty seconds later. Yeah, it was at Wilson again, was it? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm sure it was. Yeah. Yeah, Either well, way, it was just it was, it was. I'm sure that was in the mix of that kind of just run where everybody was taking points off. The pool alone. Yeah, I mean, if you if you look at their attacks so far this season for shots, they're a little bit below mid table, um, and in terms of expected goals, they are well the nineteenth, <laughs> the nineteenth for expected goals. So generally, an okay number of shots, but then when it comes to the the likelihood of those shots finding the net, you know, the the clear cut nature of those shots. They're obviously not the best shots that that they're taking, quite far out and things like that. Not good locations and stuff. And on the defensive side of the game, they have faced the f- fifth most. Um, but in terms of expected goals, yeah, the fourth most, I think, or fifth most again, actually. Mm. So I think they look like a bit of a team that. Are, Finding the feet a little bit all over the place at the minute. I wouldn't be surprised if Howe's putting this 4 4 2 in place, knowing the flaws of it, with a view to in January boosting that 4 4 2 by maybe taking like Shard out and bringing in Tarkowski or, you know, mm-hmm. just generally making the 4 4 2 a bit stronger in January and, and suffering from the downfalls in the meantime. I am, mean, it will be interesting to see who they actually buy in January. Um... I mean, there's a few at Liverpool to be fair. They can have. <laughs> yeah. Go on. Who, who would you actually? Who, who would you think would go to Newcastle? But the catch is, it has to be realistic. You can't just be use it. You can't just say names that you want to get rid of. Who could you actually at, be like at Liverpool? At Liverpool, you mean? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think Phillips could go there. Yeah, because I think he's generally suited to. Uh, a bit of a relegation scrap, but I think he can also play, and he's decent mm-hmm. in the air, and he's obviously learned his, I hate saying this, like, but learned his trade type thing at, at Liverpool under Klopp for the past couple of seasons, so yeah. that's not done him any harm. Um, so I think Phillips could be a decent one for them, mm. but I, and I think when it comes to like someone a bit further forward, I don't think they need an Anarigi really, do they? I mean, maybe they do, I don't know. No, he's, no, he's, they he's don't. got behind Wilson. Yeah, well, they've got Joel Linton, Wilson, uh, maybe St. Maximum goes there. You could put Dwight Armour Gale. there as well, Dwight Gale. But I don't know, you know, I feel like that could be the type of transfer that would get them excited, bringing in a Rigi. Yeah, well, maybe so. I mean, I he always scores and just keeps himself relevant, doesn't he? Yeah, and I suppose they are playing a front two, to be fair to them, mm-hmm. um, which just offers another space for a striker. Um, would you be happy to see a Rigi go? January Newcastle. Um, that, that's the big goodbye. <laughs> just oh, well to be honest, it, it, it would it would be one that you'd probably have to think about purely because of Afcon, really. Because if if uh, Salah and Mane are going away, even if it's only for two games, who plays in their place? And I would I would have thought it. Pro- he'll probably take one of the slots. Have you so, seen all that? It's getting postponed. Yeah, and I've, I've heard rumours yeah. on that, but I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to jump on that until I see something something yeah. like this. Yeah, why do you, do you? Who would you pick up then? Uh, probably the same two. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't think I'd let you know anyone. Do, do like you think there'd be good moves for Newcastle then, though? Like, if, I, if yeah, would... I do. I actually do. I think uh, I think Phillips has proven that he's a he's a good defender. Uh, I think he'd really suit maybe you know less of a dominant side, less of a where you'd expect it to play, so high up the pitch. Uh, yeah, maybe he'd suit a, a little bit deeper. The play all in front of him, uh, you know, where he's winning a lot of duels in the air and on the floor. I think that would suit him really well. I think he's good at that. I, I think Phillip, Phillips is a good defender. He's just maybe not the right profile to be a huge success at Liverpool, even though he done quite well when he come in. Uh, and then Origi, yeah, because I know he's a bit of a strange one, isn't he? That he, he still scores big goals. Uh, I feel like it's just maybe time he can go... You know, he spent a lot of his career, now if you think about it, as a super sub. You know, and he, he surely he must have that ambition, even though he, he obviously loves Liverpool, to to go he's, and play regular football. 
he's he's still only twenty six as well. You know, still a decent age. That's kind of like prime years, really. When you when you look yeah. at it, um, do you think he should go and play regular football? Yeah, I think I think he's definitely Premier League standard, and I don't yeah. think he's a. Uh, I think he's probably mid table and upwards Premier League standard as well. I don't think he's like yeah. the type of player who'd have to go and play for like a Norwich or a, you know, a team they're going to be scrapping for the lives. I know Newcastle are at the minute, but surely the future ambition is that that's not going to be the case. Um, just just looking at the Liverpool squad there, mate. One player I do think is just total Eddie Howe is Nico Williams. I think that I'd be an interesting one. Because he's obviously not going to get much of a look in at Liverpool, really, as he considered in Trent no. is the team's right back. And then ahead of Trent, I know Nico's played a little bit further forward at times. If he played a bit further forward, Salah's playing there. So I think if you look at Nico Williams, he, he generally performs well for his country. I think he's a decent, he's an all right player. He's got a decent prospect and things. Still only 20 years old. Um, and Newcastle have currently got Javi Manquillo as their right back. So I don't know. I, I, I doubt it. But. I wouldn't rule it out purely because of the players that Howe bought for Bournemouth. Yeah, you know, I think Brad Smith was a player that he bought. Uh, is, is a, I suppose you could put them in similar category in terms of uh, full-backs at Liverpool who aren't getting much game time yet. Mm. Um, here's, here's one, just because this always comes up. Uh, the same two players, when you play Wolves, Torreira comes up. Uh, when you play Newcastle, St. Maximum comes up. So I just feel like we should probably address that one uh, now. You know, if we're talking about potential transfers, uh, potentially Liverpool and St. Maximum. Um, I, I think we've done it before, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't. I do think he's tricky, though. I do think he's like, amazing to watch and things like that. But I just, I don't think he's... For, for one of them right, wide roles at Liverpool, you just need to be goal-obsessed, I think. And... If you if you dribble a third of the amount that Saint Maximum does, that's fine as long as you have and just a natural desire to score goals. And I think Saint Maximum is not that much of a scorer. I think he's got goals to his game, and I think he's got creation to his game as well. Quite a two way player, but mm-hmm. um, I still don't think I still don't think I'd go there. And looking at his contract, mate, his contract runs out in twenty twenty six, so he's. He's got another th- this summer. He'll have another four years remaining. Mm. Um, so I can't personally see it happen. Well, yourself. Yeah, same. I actually do. I think he's a he's a he's a player who's you know bums off seats. He's he's just so. Um, how can I put this? Bit of a maverick, isn't he? You know, he's yeah, kind he is, of. Yeah. He, 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 he could easily dribble his way out to like um, being surrounded by four defenders. Problem is, there just isn't always that end product, and um, you know. Liverpool can kind of be in a position where they can, they could ask for a player like that, but have the efficiency at the end to go with it. I just don't think he's really got that. Um, I think he's quite hard to pigeonhole. I think he just has to be able to just run around and, and and do what he wants a little bit. And uh, again, Liverpool couldn't really afford to do that. So yeah, you know, before the people kind of ask about it, I think he's an exciting player, but just maybe not a Liverpool player. Yeah, I think he's perfectly suited to a team. A bit lower than division that are going to want to counter attack into space because I think he generally does suit that sort of game. Um, he's actually top of the league at the minute for, for dribbles. He's, he's completed 10 more than the Dama, but mm. he has played about five nineties more. <laughs> so that Dama will probably top that soon before too long, as soon as he gets more minutes and things like that. Yeah, but he's, I, th- I think it's probably right in saying he's the uh. Him and Wilson are probably the two main threats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? I'd I'd agree because he can still produce. He, he can I was going to say I don't think they have a much much of a set piece threat anymore. To be honest, I think they used to. Well, you could maybe try and put Shelby in that mold, couldn't you? Um, but I wouldn't say, and I wouldn't say he's a he's a major threat. Um, the thing he can do, he can just strike a ball, can't he? Uh, I mean, I'd love to know what his conversion rate actually was like in terms of, you know, kind of shots from distance and things, because these things tend to live on reputation and reality, not very good, uh, you know, quite low. But if you if you score one or two worldies, then um, then it tends to stay with you. So he, he could he could maybe produce one of them. I think I'm sure he's always motivated when he plays at Liverpool. Uh, but they're the, they're the main threats for me. 
just looking at Shelby's shots there, mate, I see on the back of what you just said. Oh, he's, yeah. uh, so since 2014, he's took 229 shots from outside the box, Oof. which is not good. <laughs> yeah. um, How many six, goals? <laughs> six goals. Yeah, um, so what, what was that? What's the uh, what? Let's work out that conversion rate. Yeah, I was gonna do that then. Go on, we do it two to nine divided by six. Um, so he's, he's scoring every 38 shots. To be fair, that's not, I was about to say, you know, egg on face a little bit there. That's yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's not that bad. <laughs> I mean, goals from distance usually get an XG of like 0.1, 0.2, and obviously that's because they, they, they generally scored. Like two in every hundred attempts, something like that. Um, depending on how just how far out they actually are. So for Shelby to be scoring every thirty-eight shots, not that bad. That. Let's hope he hasn't just had a uh, thirty-seven long shots and he's coming coming up to his thirty-eight day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll do verdict on this one. Then. Uh, yeah. Just look. Despite a bit of a laughing joke there, I, I, I can't not see Liverpool winning this one quite comfortably. Uh, so I'm going to go with a. Uh, I'll go with a 4 nil. Yeah, I'm going to say 4 nil as well. Ah, yeah. 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 To be, do you know what? I've just worked out that <laughs> that that conversion there. And if, although I've just said he scores every 38 shots, that still equates to a 2% conversion. About. Just slightly closer to a 3%, actually. Um, it's, it's about 2.6 2. or something like that percent conversion. But I suppose then he is a little bit closer to, to normal, to average. Slightly better, I think, still, but right, okay. um, not not too much better. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I'll go with four on myself. Um, I think it should be a comfortable one. I, I think I'm more concerned about Liverpool conceding than Liverpool not scoring three. Mm. <laughs> um, funny enough, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see if any any players get rested for this because it's around this time every season that Sally usually gets a rest. Um, hopefully not, but you know we'll see. Mm. Um, so we'll round up by by speaking about Spurs then. Uh, a much bigger game. Uh, Antonio Conte now in charge. Generally improving things. Even yeah. though he's admitted that he's uh, it's a big bigger job than he thought. Yeah. I, what was interesting, I know, admittedly, I'm 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 not looking at um, Europa League stuff, but in my head, I'd kind of uh, not really seen him having that much of a big impact at the club yeah you know I watched them against Everton I uh, thought they were really poor in that day on that day sorry and albeit that was uh, his first game first Premier League game anyway in charge but uh, I've just had a look now when they've they drew that game at Goodison beat Leeds beat Tottenham beat Norwich uh, and they've only conceded one goal across those four matches so you know admittedly the, the kind of games you'd expect them to get positive results in but even so, um, I was quite surprised. You now he's had, he's shown that he's having a fairly decent impact. I guess the thing that comes into it, though, Josh, that kind of uh, or their potential factor that influences things is uh, is obviously you know the COVID stuff. Will will that affect his team selection and stuff? Yeah, well, obviously they had they had a recent game postponed. I think it was was a Burnley. Um, mm. So I mean, I, I think they've had. Reasonable time to prepare. Obviously, they've got a, a game before that, though. I think, haven't they? Have they got a game before that? Um, Midweek? No, so the so the next game they've got is... Us? No, no, sorry, it is Leicester. I thought they did. They've got Leicester away. Right. That's yeah, okay. on the... Uh, tomorrow. No, I think I, I think I generally agree with you. I think the um, you would think that they haven't really improved that much because it's because of this, maybe the start that they had. And he can't say he was coming out saying this is going to be this is going to be yeah. tricky type thing, but I do think they're moving in like that. Actually, the numbers seem to be improving a little bit, and I think Conte's system just it's just a results machine a little bit when it once it gets going. I've been a little bit surprised at the way he's used his squad a little bit, specifically the midfield two of of Hoiberg and, and Oliver Skip. You know, considering you've got Tanga and Dombele in there, and even I suppose even Harry Winks. You know, even Harry Winks is. Probably a bit more of a well, I thought I'm a bit more of a progressive player than Skip, but he seems to be favouring Skip more a lot yeah. more than I expected. Um, what, what I would say on that, so he's going to go for just with your talk, Mountain. I do feel like those in our circle, you know, maybe ones that we follow on social media or you know, talk and write about the same things, 
uh, seem to speak really highly of Skip, um, which made me th- makes me think that the more you watch him, the, the more you see his, his, his benefits. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just I'm, maybe I'm judging too much based on his, his long movement knowledge. But um, I always thought he was a tiny bit lightweight, but maybe he's one of them players who applies himself. And maybe I'll have to watch him a little bit more. But I think what I'm getting at, though, is the way he's used uh, 3 4 3. I just maybe looked at the squad before he came in and thought he'd go with the same system for, for Inter in terms of a, a 3 5 2. I thought he'd put Son and Kane up front. And I thought he'd go with kind of a midfield three rather than the two. And mm-hmm. in that midfield three would be Hoybjerg. Um I thought it was in Dombele I'd have one of the splot, one of the slots. And, you know, another another player, whether that be Deli Alley or Harry Winks or, you know, Skip or, or whatever. The Celso's in there as well. But no, we've went with four three three. But I think it's gonna be interesting actually, because we've just been speaking about things in Milan before. I know it's a different system, three four three, three five two, but Avinte is still playing very much in the way that Conte established last season. This this could be a bit of a trial run, maybe, I, I, of of how Liverpool are going to cope when they come up against Inter Milan in a few months. Yeah, it's not a bad shout actually. Um, obviously, not both carbon copies at that present. Um, adjusted a little bit, but uh, yeah, it's not a bad shout. I think. It'll be interesting to see um, how they do kind of deal with that. I mean, I'm inclined to think it they, they should be okay, um, but it, it it will be interesting. And just quickly, one thing I wanted to ask you: you mentioned and Dombele there. Are you a little bit surprised on him that he hasn't really played more, or just in general hasn't really kind of cemented the place for Tottenham since he arrived? Because obviously, he was a player that was. You know, quite, quite exciting. It felt like quite a, a coup that they got him. Quite a coup. Well, I I remember we flagged him on this podcast before he joined, and this was while he was at Leon, and he he just looked like a really really unique centre mid. You know, very very press resistant, very progressive, attack minded, physical, uh, and I think he faced Manchester City once or twice in the Champions League, and he just couldn't get near him. I think every time Leal escaped, uh, Every time Leon escaped from City's press, it would probably originate through him, and then they would they would counter attack on the back of one of his passes. So mm. when Spurs got him in, I thought they've they've absolutely nailed the replacements of of Moussa Dembele here because I think he's in the similar mould in terms of just so difficult to knock off the ball, good dribbler, uh, physical, you know, all that stuff. But I, I have no idea why it hasn't really worked so far i'm not sure what he's like as a as a character or or what or if, or if he's you know maybe he needs to watch a little bit more of space in terms of what he's like without the ball i remember a specific piece on monday night football on on him i think he he come off a half time jose Mourinho at safe more and i think character just kind of highlighted how he he was just he had a bad he had a terrible half basically um but looking up i suppose what he can be his, his talent, if you're getting the most out of him, you've got to see these play on the hands. But as I said, I'm, I've got no idea why he he hasn't really worked. I do think maybe you could throw in there that, given his nature, I think he is a bit of a risk taker on the ball. And I think in English football, if you do lose the ball or whatever, deep in your own third type thing, you are massively punished, I think, in England. Um, do, you want, do you ever think they could have been more successful at Liverpool, where there was a little bit more settled, a little bit more of an established regime in place, um, you know, stronger profiles around them, uh, where they could be a little bit more risk taking and, and it maybe not being as uh, expensive in terms of if things went wrong? Yeah, I do, but I also don't think he'd get in Liverpool starting eleven. I don't think he's. Um... I think he's great. I just think he's a brilliant player. I think he's, his highlight was amazing, for example. But I think I just don't think he'd get in get in Liverpool's team. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure what what tactical surroundings he needs to to thrive. To be honest, I think Nuno used him as a number ten and things like that on the back of his skill set. But I think he th- he thrived most at Leon Leon when he was in the midfield t- a midfield two, and that I think the fellow next to him was maybe a bit more 
you know, stay in his position, offer a bit more defensive stability, and and, and Don Bally was kind of allowed to just, I suppose, do his thing in a way. Yeah. Um, but I think the higher that you climb in the football pyramid, almost the the, the less the less you're encouraged to just do your thing, and you you got to do a bit more or something. But what what are your thoughts on um on Harry Kane this season? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought we might talk about that one. Very interesting, uh, because. Obviously, one goal, one assist, isn't it? Uh, I think he's obviously underperforming against his XG somewhere around. I haven't got the numbers to hand, but somewhere around three, maybe. Yeah, let's have a bring it up really quick. Um, yeah, I think he's around three point five, something like that. So he's he, he probably should have a few more goals to his name. Um, but to be honest, Josh, could let's be honest, how everything played out in the summer. We probably could have predicted that there was going to be a little bit of an issue this year because he clearly wanted to leave. You know, he's he's no longer an up and coming talent. He's in his prime years. He spent a lot of his career at a side who, you know, don't win trophies in Tottenham. And again, you know, don't mean that disrespectfully. Uh, I support a team who don't win trophies as well. So, you know, it's uh, definitely not me poking fun at them, but the, the, the reality is they're not. They're not a uh, city, not Liverpool, um, no Chelsea, anything like that. That they're, they're just below that bracket. So he obviously wanted to go and be more successful. Didn't get that move. Looks difficult how that move now materializes. So he's ended up staying in the same at the same club. Who, you know, for, even though Tottenham are a big club, they always seem to be never too far away from turmoil. You know, they always seem to have these kind of. Uh, and it hasn't helped by the fact that the managers they brought in Mourinho, then uh, Nuno. Now they got Conte. Conte might do well, but you know, turmoil is eventually going to follow with him, like it always does. Um, I think all of this is just turned into a little bit of a cocktail of not giving them the best environment to to start being the best version of Harry Kane again. Yeah, I'm I'm not too surprised myself to be honest. You can look at his numbers so far this season. He in terms of shooting, which is, I suppose, a huge element of Harry Kane's game, he's averaging the fewest shots per 90 than in any of his previous seasons. Uh, last season under Mourinho, he was averaging 3.9 per 90. This season, it's down to 2.6. Um, his previous low was 2.7 as an average. So you could argue he's not getting, he's not getting the chances at the minute. Uh, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure how much that's changed since Conte. You know, obviously some of those numbers will be based on Nuno's time in charge. But I do still think, obviously, there's a top player in there and things like that. But he's he, he looks. I think he looks really slow. <laughs> I think he looks very. Just I don't know. He doesn't look full of vitality. He doesn't like that. He doesn't look hungry or. Um, you, do you think that could be a psychological thing or a physical thing? I honestly don't know. And maybe it's just my eyes playing six with me or whatever. But I maybe if I was to watch Spurs play as a, as a you know a gang of silhouettes, a gang, a gang of shadows, maybe I wouldn't pick up on that too much. Maybe because it's Kane's playing playing games with me on the head. But I don't know. It's just something something that doesn't look right attached to his game. And then if you look at his numbers, they do they have suffered a little bit of a drop this season. Mm. But I do think it's mad how uh, how Spurs have you know the direction they've kind of went since. Being like level, level maybe with Liverpool a few years back, I think it's kind of the two clubs have kind of shown how and how not to kind of finish off an evolution, if you like. Um, can you see a little bit of uh, it? Been the conversations we had before the Derby show. Can you see a little bit of Everton in Tottenham? Maybe you know looking uh, for the shortcut thing and looking to quickly just uh, be successful and not maybe really building something. A little bit, but I do think Spurs did build something, didn't get any silverware from it. And I think kind of like the remnants of what they built are still there. Son is still there, Kane's still there, Larissa's still kind of hanging on. Um, and I do think Levy is is kind of just thinking, I, I need to get a trophy for these boys, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think that's yeah. why he's appointed Mourinho, proven winners, uh, apparently. Can't say the next proven winner you could probably get in. So I think I think Daniel Levy's just kind of trying to conclude Kane's time at the club with trophies in any way he possibly can. And I think 
as a result, Spurs have kind of went down a bit of a short term in the past couple of seasons. But one thing I would I, I have worried about with Spurs that seems to have been the case is over the years he started getting in backups. Like Ben Davis was a backup for Danny Rose, I think, mm. and they got Keenan Sipier in as a backup for Kyle Walker. And over time, rather than those players remaining as backups or whatever, they have become starters. And just gradually, the quality level of Spurs has just dropped a little bit. It's like, for example, Liverpool getting Simakas in, or Tomiskas, <laughs> um, to replace Robertson. But, it, sorry, to, to back up Robertson, but then when Robertson leaves, Simakas becomes the starter. You, if, you, if you do a bit of that over the course of the full 11, you just gradually, you know, lesser in quality well, type thing. Arsenal have done it, haven't they, really? They've just kind of... They've, they've dropped a few levels due to the recruitment that they've made over the last few years. Um, I'm just just on the point I was trying to make about the short-term thing, I agree with you in terms of they did build, but I do wonder how much that was the success of what Pochettino done as opposed to maybe you know what the club done. Um, I feel like they might have just got a little bit lucky with them because uh, obviously they had Harry Redknapp for a few years, then you bring Villas Boas in, who, you know, kind of didn't really do it at Chelsea. Um, he goes Tim Sherwood. You could say that again was quite short term. Then you go for Poch from Southampton, which, you know, I know he turned out to be a very good coach, but at Southampton, you know, he was probably on par with like maybe what Koeman had done there. You still didn't know if he was going to be that great. It was almost like. Could be unfair to say this, but maybe flavour of the month type thing. Um, he comes in, obviously, to proves to be great. Then they go Mourinho, short term. You touched on it to maybe try and win something. Doesn't happen. They then have to kind of settle for Nuno, and now they've gone for Conte. I think if you just compare it to, to compare to say, Liverpool, you know, I think the, the approaches is definitely different, and they don't look that great, if I'm being frank. Yeah, no, they they do look very um, all over the place, I suppose, when you put it like that in terms of the direction that they want to take over the past few years. So obviously, Poch gives them a bit of stability and things like that, but mm-hmm. they do seem a little bit a little bit lost. But I do think when it comes to getting Conte in, I mean, it's probably the best coach they could have appointed. But, but I, I rate Conte very, very highly. Um, and I think it's going to be interesting to see how Liverpool get on against him because he does have set patterns of play that Liverpool can can identify hmm. um, and hopefully prevent but his teams are, are always notoriously good at progressing to the thirds of the pitch and if Liverpool are going to try and dominate the game it's going to be quite difficult to prevent that so um, what's your verdict on this one? Uh, I don't know there's, there's always this thing now where you, I revert it back into that thing of always back in Liverpool you know it feels very kind of 2019-20 vibes uh, but I'll say this game's going to be a little bit tougher. Um, maybe a 1 1 or 2 1 because with the Liverpool show, I'll go to 2 1 Liverpool. But wouldn't surprise me if this one just threw a little bit of spine in the works and it was ended up being a, a draw. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I totally agree with you. I would lean towards 1 1 or 2 1. Um, I do think Liverpool's attack might have too much in the end and might just get them over the line. But I would be interested to see just how Spurs play, how how attacking Conte is and things like that. Mm. But it's not a game I'm uh, looking at as a given. I don't think. I think it could be one that Liverpool very easily drop points in. I'm not sure, but it's going to be a tricky game that one, yeah. Yeah, because the other thing is they might have fresher legs. They've played a lot less football, haven't they, over the past uh, yeah over the past few weeks? Where there's at least two Premier League games they've missed. I don't know if they missed a game in Europe as well. Uh, I think they did, didn't they, against Rennes, was it? Yeah, it was, uh, yeah. So they played three games less than what Liverpool probably have over the past two weeks, and you just wonder. Uh, I mean, Liverpool always seems to actually do better when they have these back-to-back games. They seem to hit a bit of momentum, but, uh, you know, would that will that be a factor as well? Yeah, it's hard to say. Well, again, it plays in with the the possibility, I suppose, of Salah getting rested or some, or something like that. Considering Liverpool have played a lot more than Spurs, Liverpool have to play Spurs on Sunday away from home. You just never know, really. But uh, yeah, we'll round up there, mate. So uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, mate. Cheers, everyone. 
and we'll be back next week um, as we approach the busy Christmas period and Christmas Day and things like that. We'll do our best to keep podcasts going, even though we've both got a bit of time off. Um, but yeah, we'll see you then. Thanks for tuning.